What a saint. We use this word to speak kindly of another. My grandmother is such a saint. You are a saint to stop and help me change my tire. Football teams have borrowed the word, but when one of their linebackers sacks a quarterback, it's anything but saintly. The thesaurus actually uses synonyms for saint like sufferer, martyr, victim, scapegoat. Francis of Assisi was declared a saint by the church following his death. He had started out as the son of a wealthy cloth merchant and left everything to follow Christ. St. Francis's order of monasticism continues today to be marked by those who have denounced worldly things and who serve all of creation in simplicity and humility. Francis was known to stop on a forest path and speak to the birds. He began the day thanking Brother Sun for rising and went to bed thanking Sister Moon for gracing the shadows of the night with her light. One author wrote, The Spirit of God is laboring on our behalf throughout creation. If only we will open ourselves to receive the gifts. The family dog who slurps your face in the morning. The blue jays who nag at you for more peanuts. The sycamores who cry for water in these greenhouse times. The flowers whose beauty begs to be smelled and inspected. St. Francis of Assisi would say, Amen. Francis once said these words which anchor today's sermon on love as we continue our summer series on words to live by. Francis said, Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. Today continues this series. We've looked at the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, Micah 6, verse 8, the Beatitudes, Psalm 23, and other classical texts of the Bible. Many of you have suggested ones to finish out the summer, and I have selected three of those out of the ones that were sent in, and then throughout the fall and the winter, I will get the others so that we be sure to cover all those passages that were suggested. But we have been embracing these words of our Lord that are, in, that are indeed words by which we live when we look at John 13. This morning we turn to one of, of Jesus' final teachings just before the crucifixion. In fact, it was taught on the night of the Last Supper. He had washed the disciples' feet in verse 15, prepared them for his teaching, and then he said, For I have set an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Now, a lot of denominations, a lot of Christian members of, family, of the family of Christ believe that the washing of the feet is what Jesus was giving as the example. And it was very beautiful, and it's still used in the brethren tradition, and I'll be talking about this with the, the children this morning. But if you look at the text closely, he gives the washing of the feet as an example of what he's teaching. The example is what he was doing. Jesus commands us to do as he has done for us. So this sounds a bit like the golden rule, but, but it is so much more. I want you to pull out your little blue sheet. I think I've, yesterday afternoon I decided I wanted to put these in all the bulletins, and so I had to find bulletins around the building at various places, like a pile at the choir room, some down by the... the near the uh, weekday entrance, but I hope you each have this. I want you to follow along with this today and take it home with you because it does make a huge difference in understanding this text. One year at Massanetta Springs Bible Conference, we had the joy of meeting Dr. Leonard Sweet, a United Methodist pastor and professor of evangelism at Drew Theological School. Leonard shared with us the various rules of human relationships or the levels of human relationships leading up to the new commandment of Jesus in John chapter 13. Listen to this and follow along on the insert and you'll discover afresh that when we ask the question, what's love got to do with it, the answer is everything. 
In the world, there is a pervasive rule that has been in existence since humanity began, and it is what Sweet calls the iron rule. And it is do unto others before they do unto you. Fighting among human beings often follows this rule. But in the Old Testament, God's law introduced a new rule, which, as Dr. Sweet continues using the image of the precious metals, could be called the silver rule. We find it in Exodus 21, verse 24. God has just shared the Ten Commandments with the people of Israel and follows it with various other laws, among them what we might call the silver rule. Do unto others as they do unto you. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a life for a life. In the New Testament, Jesus confirms a new rule, one that we all learned when we were little. What is the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is a good rule, but it is far from the best because it depends heavily upon what each of us perceives as the best way to be treated. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you on vacation. We sometimes get to watch daytime TV shows that are never part of our daily routine. And I saw a portion of a talk show one day on the topic of parents who are afraid of their kids. Now these children were cussing their parents. They were absolutely disobedient in the recorded portion that was shared with the audience. And then just before the boys walked out onto the stage, as they were supposed to enter the studio, the door was open and the boys slammed the door shut and didn't come out. And with that, one of their mothers jumped up from her seat and said, I'm going to get them out here. And she ran to the door and she grabbed the boys and she spanked them as they were on their way. And she pushed them out onto the stage, yelling the whole time. Two boys, seven and ten, emerged onto the platform amidst scolding and screaming. Then they screamed back at their mother, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well... That can sometimes be a very good rule, but it can also be dangerous. It is fine in the hands of loving people, but the golden rule can be deadly in the hands of those who only know how to relate to each other in hateful ways. Dr. Sweet pointed out one more rule among the precious metals that has pervaded our society. And I, I know every time I refer to Dairy Queen, there's a, there's a real swelling of sales down the street but don't okay in the Dairy Queen for almost a decade my father's primary teaching was the customer is always right the customer is always right so I'd finish a hamburger and I'd lay it out there and I'd think man that's the best burger I've ever made and the person would come back and say my burger is terrible and the answer Please give it to me. I'll make you another one. And here's a free ice cream cone as you wait. You know, that's the way. The customer is always right. That's the platinum rule. Do unto others as they would have you do unto them. This is the pervading rule of any service industry. It is a great rule in that it constantly is looking to what the other person needs. And it is an extremely unselfish rule. But it is not enough. Jesus in John 13 introduces the final rule of human relationships, this highest level, which Leonard Sweet names for the most precious metal on the periodic chart. Artificial hearts are constructed partly out of this material, titanium. It is known as a titanium heart because it is made out of a metal that is so hard and durable that it does not rust, it will not fail, and it is not rejected by the human body. Hip replacements most often include titanium prostheses. Dr. Sweet says that Jesus gave us the titanium rule, which is do unto others as I have done unto you. Do unto others as I have done unto you. Look at the text, and it's crystal clear. John 13, verses 34 and 35. I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So what's love got to do with it? 
In the 1980s, Tina Turner had a song by this title. The problem is the lyrics be, describe a shallow, hurtful love when she would sing, What's love got to do, got to do with it? What's love but a second-hand emotion? What's love got to do, got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Weak. Weak. Okay, it's not the kind of love that we're talking about. So when I ask the question, what's love got to do with it? I want you to think of the titanium rule and answer everything. And this is true. You as Presbyterians actually get to say something. Okay? What's love got to do with it? Everything. Again, what's love got to do with it? Everything. Sisters and brothers, Jesus loves us so completely, so passionately, so unselfishly because he gave his own life for you and me. But Jesus believes we can perfect the gift of love even further when he says in John 14 verse 12, Tr Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and in fact will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus follows this with a reference once again to the titanium rule. Those who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father and I will love them and reveal myself to them. So what's love got to do with it? Everything. If we still don't get it, if we aren't quite convinced that love has everything to do with, the, with living this life for the Lord, Jesus says in John 15 verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Then he shares the titanium rule in its clearest, most concise form in chapter 15 verse 19. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved loved you. What's love got to do with it? Everything. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. We are to preach the gospel, the good news, in the way that we love patiently, unselfishly, with kindness, rejoicing in the right, bearing all things, believing all things, hoping all things, enduring all things. Faith, hope, and love abide in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. Faith, Hope and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. What's love got to do with it? Everything. In 1942, a group of Scottish soldiers were captured by the Japanese at Singapore. They were held in a prison camp where they had to do hard labor day after day after day. And one afternoon as they were building a jungle bridge, the captives were returning to the camp. And at the first tool checkpoint, a shovel was missing. The Japanese guard went ballistic. He threatened to harm everyone if the culprit did not confess. The Scottish soldiers looked at their own wounds from previous torture and could only imagine what might happen to them all. No one confessed to having taken the shovel. The guard threatened to kill them one by one. Suddenly a Scotsman broke the line and stepped forward only to be beaten to death by the guard with a shovel. And his comrades carried his lifeless body back towards the camp. At the second checkpoint, they counted the shovels again and found that they had just simply miscounted the first time. This man had given his life for his friends. What's love got to do with it? Everything. This week, the horror in France continued with the murder of 86-year-old Father Jacques Hamel in a quiet village outside Normandy. Miles McDonald and I were talking about this this week and he shared with me that Pope Francis condemned the killing by saying the world is at war because it has lost peace. There is a war of interest. There is a war for money, a war for natural resources, a war to dominate people. Some think that it is a war of religion. It is not. All religions in the world want peace. Others want war. Father Hamill was celebrating the Mass in the heart of a congregation that loved him. The Reverend Alexander Jolie, a priest from a nearby parish, expressed horror at the killing of Father Hamill. It was, Jolie says, the moment in the Mass when the priest is giving this act of love that he is killed. It is incomprehensible. 
Hamill gave his life in service to others, full of the love of Christ. What's love got to do with it? Everything. A year ago, a gunman opened fire on a recruiting station in Chattanooga, Tennessee. In an interview with NPR, Safa Abu Alpha, who came to the mosque in Chattanooga for afternoon prayers on that Friday, said that she was scared. She was scared for her family's safety after she found out that the shooter was Muslim. We don't want to be hated by everybody, she said. You know, everyone hates us, and it's scary. Well, at an interfaith worship service at Olivet Baptist Church that week in Chattanooga, many from the Islamic Society of Greater Chattanooga attended alongside 1,000 worshipers. Their representative, Moshi Ali, was invited to the pulpit to speak, and as he began, Moshi said, Would all of our Muslim brothers and sisters please rise? And as they rose, applause began among the Christians, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and then all of the Christians stood, and the standing ovation continued for three solid minutes. What's love got to do with it? Everything. As you serve Christ, you have been gifted with that kind of love. It is the new commandment of Jesus, the titanium rule. Do unto others as I have done unto you. Jesus says, love others enough to be willing to die for them. As you have seen me love like that, you must do it too. This is my commandment to my disciples. What's love got to do with it? Everything. What's love got to do with it? Everything. Let us pray. Lord, help us to love like you. Amen.